Will you stand with us? God, 
pray together. Lord, we thank you for your goodness here in our life. When we think about it, we realize we owe it all to you because it all comes from you. And so, God, we just pause today to give you thanks, to remember the source of it all. God who loves us, the God who smiles on us, the God who cares for us. We thank you for that. That you keep providing for us every single day. That you put breath in our lungs. God, you fill us with hope. We thank you for that. We pause to pray for those that are burdened, that are struggling, that are hurting. God, that you will fill them today. And you'll remind them of your love for them. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Good morning, Orchard Grove. Will you do me a favor and uh, say hello to someone nearby, and then you can have a seat this morning. All right, I have a special announcement today. The Detroit Lions are playing tonight at 8.30. All right, just in case you didn't know. Your source of information right here. Uh, the other announcement is the men are getting together Tuesday night. So men's night, Tuesday night at 6.30, and we're really excited about that. And uh, today I'm going to introduce uh, a new series, and um, we'll see how it goes. Um, if it doesn't go well, it'll be a one-week series. <laughs> it's, it's very possible. Uh, I'll tell you about, more about it in a minute, but it's called uh, God is Still Good. God is Still Good. And uh, I think what, what I hope to work through in the next few weeks is uh, especially for people that struggle and... Uh, Maybe things aren't working out exactly the way you thought they would, or you thought God was supposed to, you know, answer a prayer this way, and uh, it hasn't kind of lined up the way someone told you it was, it was supposed to. And uh, so we're going to maybe plow into some more difficult um, things. But I think the goal would be your faith will get tested a little bit, and then it will come out stronger on the other side. So sometimes what we like to do is not test it, you know, because we're a little scared <laughs> how fragile it's going to be. So can we push on it a little bit? Because, I mean, I mean if it, well, it, all right, well, you're already here, so hopefully you don't leave before the message starts. And, uh, but if we push on it a little bit, um, it, it's either going to break or it's going to work. But if it breaks, then you've got to get some new something that's not going to break when it gets pushed on. Well, that's worth thinking about. You might, want to, you might want to invite somebody to this series. Maybe somebody that's struggling with the idea of faith. You know, maybe that would be a good thing. Um, so I'll introduce, I'll introduce it today. Um, and then in, in a minute, we're going we're gonna to participate in the offerings. So we'll ask the team to prepare and they'll come by. And before we do that, though, we need to take a minute and uh, we need to welcome all of our online family. So to everyone online, welcome to Orchard Grove. Thanks for being a part today. Wherever, wherever you're watching from, so glad you did it. And uh, if you're watching from South Wixom, get out of bed. I'll see you in 10 minutes. All right. Anyway. Thanks for being here today. If you're new, we like to say church is free, so please don't feel obligated. It's our treat to have you as a guest. And at the end of the service, if you need prayer, um, our team will be here at the front to pray with you. God bless. Enjoy.
Thank you guys. Appreciate that very wasn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful. Oh man. Always. And uh, you know, I was thinking about these. If you guys see a Bible over there in black. Uh, hmm. Oh wait, no, is there one did I, did I take it back there? I don't know. Maybe it, uh, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. I can. Um, but anyway, I was, I was saying, like, uh, you know, like Phil's over here playing the bass, and he could be playing this instrument. And last week, someone didn't show. Do you ever notice? Like, how many know, like, the thing that makes me doubt my faith is why did God give some people all the talent? That's the thing. I have questions for God. Anybody ever try to, thank you. Oh, there's some notes, too. Anybody, anybody ever try to, uh, Teach yourself guitar? Like, 
I got three or four friends that have at least a thousand dollars worth of guitars in their garage and can't play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Uh, thank you guys. We appreciate it. They get up early too. They get up early and I don't know if we appreciate them enough and thank you. And, and a lot of them, they, they, they gig on Saturday, you know what I mean? Like they're not really awake. And so we pre they get up early. They, a lot of them get home at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, and they get up early to get here. So we appreciate them. Um, so interestingly, I'm going to ask your permission, because you got up relatively early. I mean, you're here or you're there. And I'm going to ask your permission to <clears throat> so be a little bit different, which is why I don't know how well this series is going to go, but... I want to ask your permission to talk to the kind of the people that aren't here. And if you're here, you, you, you probably believe. And I want to talk, talk to people that are struggling to believe for a few weeks, if I can. And, and um, so I feel bad because you got up <laughs> and you're here, but I don't know who else to talk to. And... You know, the Apostle Paul, if you read the story in Acts 17, he, he's traveling and he goes to Athens. And, um, and when, he's, when he's there, he goes into the synagogue. And it says he talks to his fellow Jews because he's Jewish. And, of course, he would go to the place where the other Jewish people would meet. That's the religious uh, worship, place of worship. And um, Paul was Jewish. He was brought up Jewish, so he was welcome there. And he was comfortable there. He was familiar there. Just like probably many of you would be comfortable or familiar going to a church. If you were out of town, you'd walk in. And it might be a little different from Orchard Grove, but it, it's a church. And you would kind of... And so Paul was very comfortable there. And he was talking to his fellow Jews. And he was reasoning with them from the scriptures. Because they were also comfortable with the scriptures. They would have been comfortable with what we call... Today, the Old Testament. But that's what they would have. And Paul reasoned with them from their own scriptures. Um, and then it says, then he went to the marketplace. Well, going from the synagogue to the marketplace is, um, it's a whole different animal there. Because the marketplace, people are in the market. Like tomorrow morning, you're, most of you are going to the marketplace. And... Uh, no one really cares what the book of Exodus says as much as they care about what, what's in that contract. Uh, are you with me? I'm close. <laughs> or or no, am, I, am I completely out to lunch? Or You're going to sit down and they're not going to say, well, let's first talk about the gospel of Matthew. No, they're going to say, uh, let's say I just got this email from corporate and you're $87,000 off budget. And uh, am I close? Okay. I'm just trying to make sure I was connecting some level. So Paul, this is important because Paul was in the synagogue and he was talking their language. And then he went to the marketplace. And when he went to the marketplace, he had to talk what? Their language. He didn't pull out the scriptures. He just, he actually started talking poets because it was like, well, you know, as your poets have said, Epimenides, these kind of guys. And he's talking about things that people commonly talked about in their circles. Maybe today you'd say, well, you know, I just got, uh, Elon Musk just said, or I just got whoever, right? I'm not, relax, I'm not picking sides, whatever. I don't know what the sides are anymore. But it, it, you would talk about what's being talked about amongst the people. And so Paul was brilliant in doing this because he, he was like, He was like the original Bo Jackson, the two-sport athlete, right? He could go into the synagogue and just go at it with his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters through the scriptures. But then he could step out in the marketplace and he could tangle there as well. So if you will give me permission, I'm going to step just for a little bit, if you'll follow the metaphor, out of the synagogue into the marketplace for a few minutes. Maybe even if it goes well a few weeks. Okay? 
That's all I'm going to do. So I will use scripture because actually I think it is relevant, but it, sometimes what I, what I also will do is talk to, to some people here who are struggling to believe. <clears throat> so this could be good because you say, well, Chris, I'm, man, I'm good, man. When they were singing, I'm all in, and that's good. Um, I've also been around some people that when the singing happens at church, they're not all in because they, they struggle to believe in the goodness of God, usually because of something that's happened in their life. So they grew up under uh, a, a teaching or a saying that was like, well, God is good, and if you do good, then good's going to happen in your life. And then when good doesn't happen in your life, Anybody? Anybody never have something not good happen in your life? <laughs> this isn't going to take long. Then you have to go back and you have to reconcile what you were taught. Well, I was taught that God is good. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the atheists, this is where the, most atheists get their, their material. Right? It, it, it's that, well... You, you guys talk about this all-powerful God. And all-powerful means there isn't any power not available. By definition, can do anything. Okay? And then you talk about this all-loving God, therefore would always do the loving good thing. Look at this beautiful baby over here. Mommy's just snuggling. I mean, what a perfect picture of love. If you do anything for that baby. Huh? Maybe you do anything for that baby. You protect. So if I came over there to harm, I mean, Jamie loved me, but bro, I mean, he'd have to say something. He'd have to have words. He would stand up. He would defend. That's what a loving father would do. Huh? If he just sat there and says, ah, what the heck? He'd be like, bro, what kind of dad are you? True? Meanwhile, you're saying, what kind of a pastor are you attacking the baby? I get it. Okay, it's, just, it's a metaphor. It's, it just came into my head because it's so sweet. <laughs> I'm going to plan some of these out next week. Don't worry. So th then, th then you have to reconcile. And this is, again, this is where the, the atheists get to pr the, the majority of the material is, well, you got to reconcile that. Either he's not that tough. Or he doesn't care. If you sit there and do nothing, you don't care. You can't be, can't be all loving God. If he's weakling, what kind of what good does that do you? Chris, why are you making us all uncomfortable? Because we were all just singing and praising, and now just threw a wrench in the whole thing. As I said, introducing this, it's. It's okay to push on your faith a little bit. Um, let, me, let me read a couple of scriptures. <laughs> Bail myself out. But no. Uh, but just to, just to get you, get you thinking. Uh, James. What good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Now, He's talking about a kind of faith, a kind of faith that doesn't translate into action. Another verse. First Peter, these, now this is talking about, these is reference to a verse prior that's talking about suffering and trial and unfair things. When you suffer, I was, I was reading a story this morning from a rabbi who wrote a book about this, this subject, and he was talking about his son uh, was diagnosed with a very rare condition that he would rapidly grow old. And when their daughter was born, right around the son's third birthday, the son had already started losing hair, and they didn't know what was going on. They found it's a super rare condition where you, you, you go through life very, very quickly, prematurely, and, and you, you die in your teens, that you're in old age. And he was already losing his hair, he was wrinkly, and 
old looking and he's like, man, I'm a, I'm a rabbi. I spent my life talking about people about God, trying to just do good and be a light in the world. And then I get this diagnosis. And every birthday, they would, him and the wife, they would celebrate and then they would go in the back room and cry. Because they knew they were about to hand him over. How do you reconcile that? Okay? So, 1 Peter 1, these trials, these sufferings have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, your faith of greater worth than gold. So I want you to focus on the genuineness of it. And here's what I want just to focus on, just, just for a minute. Your faith, there are different levels or kinds, I guess you could say, of faith. You could just say, I, oh, I believe in God. That's, that's a level of faith. And for most of us, what happens is, as we go through life and as we grow through life, our faith strengthens or gets stronger. It goes to a different level. But to let go of the, I'll call it the low level, there's nothing wrong with a low level of faith. Are you with me? There's nothing wrong with that because you have to start somewhere. On the way to church, I'm, I'm not trying to like brag because I'm a pastor. It's just, uh, Charlie, she could, Dad, can I bring my Bible to church? She's got this little kid's Bible. And I said, sure, you know. Um, and she gets in and is just in the back seat and she's reading, but she can't read, but she's telling me the whole story from the beginning. Adam, God made all the stuff, and then he made Adam, and then, she kept saying, and then uh, there was a sneaky snake, and then the sneaky snake did this, and they, they were supposed to not eat from this certain tree of the good, evil knowledge. She was getting it kind of right, and, and then she was going through it. She got all the way to Noah, and I'm like, oh, my. I had this whole, like, holy, sacred moment. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, feeling blessed and terrified. That's how I felt. I felt blessed, like, wow. And I felt terrified, like, I'm giving her a picture of God. What a sacred thing that must be. And I can't do it perfectly because I don't understand God perfectly, but all I can do is give it my best. But she's got some simple childlike faith. It's very simple she hasn't run into the complexities of life yet. You get what I'm saying? This problem hasn't been deposited yet on her. So how do you get a more genuine faith? We'll call it that. Or you could use the word mature. It says it has to be refined by fire. Refined by fire. What does that mean? You've got to go through some stuff. And what I'm going to try to do over this, why I'm introducing it is, I'm going to try to turn the heat up on our faith. You know, so like this morning for my devotional time, I'm listening to, uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's deceased now. I should check my facts on that. <laughs> but that would be terrible to say. But Christopher Hitchens, all prominent, I guess that's good. You guys don't all study atheism, but I, I, I have to some degree, and so I'm, 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 I'm listening to the, the, the dominant voices of atheism to our young, especially to our young culture and generation. You know, so what are they teaching? What are they saying? So, in other words, what I'm saying is, if if you can't turn the heat up on your faith, then it might not be worth holding on to. You know, and you might, when you turn, the, see how they would refine gold back then, and it's saying faith is more valuable than gold. And, but a lot of times you have faith and it's mixed in with a lot of other stuff. So while I actually said, can I have permission to talk to people that aren't here? Really what I'm doing is I'm talking to the percentage of you that doesn't really believe. I'm talking to the dross in you. You may know what dross is. If you... Dross is when you, when you refine gold, you, you turn up the heat, and the dross is the non-gold that comes to the top, and they skim it off. So what we're going to do over a few weeks is I'm just going to turn the heat up on you. 
Instead of you asking me all the questions, I'm gonna ask you questions about what you believe. I'm gonna turn it up hotter and make you uncomfortable and then the dross is gonna come up to the top and then we're gonna try to skim it off. Are you, are you in for that? It's gonna get hot in here, I wore a sweater. It's gonna get hot in here. You're thinking, <laughs> Man, I went to church and my pastor just beat up on my faith the whole time. I didn't think that was gonna happen. But if, if somebody beats up on it, if somebody turns the heat on it, then it can become more genuine and more pure. Then the dross can come out. Is this making any sense to you? Do you know what they say? How, how the refiner knew when the gold was genuine and when it was absolutely pure, they would boil it and skim off the dross. Boil it and skim off the How do they know when, it do, when they're done? When the refiner can see his reflection in the gold. How do you know when God's done refining your faith? When maybe when God can see his reflection in you? Faith is more valuable than gold, Peter's talking about. I, I can't think of anything in my life that would be more important than to have genuine faith and so what i'm talking about is that i'm not just talking i'm talking to you because there's parts of you and that's okay it's not a bad thing nobody claims that they are pure solid gold but there are parts of us that do struggle when these things are brought up you're like yeah i don't know exactly about that or or you haven't been hit with the big one yet you know the big one it's like, it's one thing that's, yeah, yeah, that sounds good, that sounds good. And then the big one happens. The big test. Why? No one really prepared me for that. I mean, where is God when this stuff happens? Why doesn't this get fixed right away? These are very good questions. But suffering and going through these things can help us shed our shallow faith. Do you remember when Jesus told a story about the farmer planting the seeds? Remember the story? And he's like, there was a farmer and he was just sowing seed and, and some seed you know, went to a path because when you walk in the dirt, you make a path and it becomes hard and the seed would land there and that would go nowhere. It would just land on the top. The birds would come and take the seed and there was no chance for it to ever grow any fruit. But then some seed would land in shallow soil. They call it rocky because there was a layer of soil, but then there was a layer of rock. And so the seed never got down real deep. But it would, it would, it would go in and then there were, a plant would appear. But the problem was the, 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 there was a rock layer there. So the, the roots couldn't get very deep. And when the roots can't go very deep, then the sun comes and the sun turns up the, the heat. Now you got to think. Now think about this for a little bit. Sun turns up the heat, but who's ever heard of photosynthesis? We need the what? You need the sun for it to grow. This is a tough one. You need it to grow, but if your roots aren't deep, if your faith isn't deep, the very thing that's going to help it grow will kill it. You got to be able to stand the heat, you know. You, you, we, we need, and I, I'll take us all on a journey if you go. <laughs> if it's empty next week, I'll know to switch. I'll just know, all right. This, does that make sense? I'll know. All right, no, that's not what they wanted to talk. So uh, vote you with your behind, I should say, right? You, there's a lot of people wilting. And I get it because I don't think anyone really tested their faith. I don't think anyone got the jackhammer out and said, well, we've got, we got to make some good soil here. we got to be able to, ours has to go deep. So, yeah, some really bad things are going to happen. Some really challenging things are, and all this, it, but my roots are deeper than this simple, shallow faith. Not a terrible place to start, but eventually, eventually, 
your faith will have to develop. It's, it's going to have to become a little more mature. So this is, let me tell you who this series is for. This is for people who've hit a crisis in their faith, who've hit a wall. And, and maybe you hit the wall because of your own personal suffering, because you, you yourself have had an experience that doesn't reconcile with the God that you grew up with. And one of the things that I can tell you is you are not alone. And one of the interesting things about the Bible, even though often the Bible is used only, its verses are cherry-picked to, to get us to go, yay, God, and believe. And, and I'm for that. Trust me, I'm for that. Like, I call them the refrigerator verses. You know, the ones you put on there, and no weapon formed against me will prosper. If God is for me, who can be against me? Oh, okay, I got it. I got it. I know them. I quote them. Whether you've skipped over them or not, the Bible is loaded with question verses. Why the heck did this happen? Where is God now? When, God, when, when, how long, oh Lord, how long? If I can, just for a minute, I'll just wade into the book of Job. Because if the Bible was trying to paint this rosy picture, actually, in defense of the Bible, the Bible is the one that dives deeply into this question over and over and over again. We'll, we'll take the book of Job. There, there's a man named Job who is blameless and upright. This is a part of the story. He's blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. It, Kind of summarized like this. He's God's man, right? And he was wealthy. He owned all these oxen and sheep and donkeys. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. I mean, we just set him up there as the pinnacle guy, right? He used to take his, uh, he used to take turns holding feasts, his sons, uh, rather. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters. There were seven sons and three sisters. When the period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. I mean, like the ultimate dad. Like, just in case you guys screwed up at one of the feasts here, let me just get you covered. Uh... Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for them, thinking, perhaps my children, my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. He's covering all the bases spiritually or religiously. Are you get, is that what this is saying to us? Here's a guy that never missed church. Here's a guy that always gave in the offering. Here's a guy that volunteered whatever the other check marks we would give. Here's a guy that got baptized. Here's a guy that, are you with me? Catechism, he did it. Crushed catechism. Here's a guy that took first Holy Communion. Here's a guy, whatever religious background you're from, check, 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 check. The assumption is when you do that, God puts this little protective blanket around you, and what? Nothing bad happens to you because you did your religious obligation. You did your duty. Therefore, you're covered. And as you know, there is this scene that's set up where the accuser comes and tells God, oh, he's not that, he's not all that. Does he fear God for nothing? He goes, you put a hedge around him. Put a little protective blanket around him. Take that down. And God says to him, very well, everything he has is in your hands, but don't touch him. You can touch all of his stuff, don't touch him. And then the disaster ensues. One day, Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking, at the older brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing nearby. The Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants in the, to the sword, and I am the only one left to tell you. Why? 
while he was still speaking. Now, you know, this is how disasters work, right? You haven't even caught your breath to process the first one. The guy's still speaking, and another guy runs in to Job. Another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding armies and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put your servants to the sword. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, what's the saying that we have? When it rains, it you ever have a month like that? Hey, could, could I just sit down and get my hand around one of these? My head. Bam, 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 bam. As Tom Cruise said in A Few Good Men, and the hits just keep coming. Yet another messenger came. Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the older brother's house, and suddenly a mighty wind swept. I mean, you could imagine. You know, what I mean, basically everything else he was losing, that was his livelihood, that was his wealth, his camel and sheep and all these things. And but boy, I mean, you know, that, that that's devastating to love. You lost your job. And you not only have you lost your job, but you lost everything that you saved your entire life. Somebody stole your inheritance. Somebody stole you all your wealth or something like that. It'd be like saying someone came in, you found it tomorrow afternoon, someone stole your identity, and they literally they emptied you of everything and ran up a debt. And there's nothing you can do about it. And you're just really in devastation, and then you get news about your children. This is obviously set up in the most extreme. Is it what... what would you agree? This is being, as you do when you're making any kind of an argument, you set it up in the, in the most extreme to make a point. And now he's, uh, this wind came, swept uh, from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. I mean, if, I mean, locally, right? Those of us locally are like, what was it, like a week and a half ago or something? We had this massive wind, whatever, whatever it was, people were saying, it was a ton, I don't know what it was, but this thing just came in, just started ripping stuff, right? And we were all watching people's things fly. Everybody was down to the neighbor's house picking up something, right? It just comes out of nowhere, bam. But this knocked the house over and killed the children in the house. Now listen to this. We're going to do some work. We're going to do some work over the next few weeks. Are you, are you with me? Okay. So it collapsed on them, and they're all dead. I'm the only one who has escaped. At this, Job got up, tore his robes, shaved his head, fell to the ground in worship, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. This is like, uh, I'm going to talk about this for a minute. Well, let's be really honest. That's not what you would say. Come on, don't fake with me. Let's be brutally honest. That's not what anyone here would say. Now, what, what is this? This, is the, this? this could be the ultimate man that we should emulate. That could be it. However, if you keep reading, this is only the first test. There's another test coming. We, we haven't gotten to Job himself, which is the next attack on him physically, his physical body covered with sores and pus. I, one of the things, of, you know, pastoring for so long is I'd sit with a lot of people in a lot of devastating family experiences. Devastating. The truth, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. The truth is what I see is a lot of people in our, in our family here, 
I don't know how to say this, but I guess I'll just say it as truthfully as I can. I, they have a lot more faith than I do. Because I sit with them in these things and I watch them endure the most unimaginable things. And I think, I don't think I could endure that. I, I don't think I could react that way. Which we'll, we'll cycle back to in a minute. But one of the things that I have noticed over time is people that grow up in church and have this strong, uh, at least starter faith, many times react like that. Well, not, maybe not exactly, but something terrible happens where they lose a loved one and they go, well, they give some s- spiritual statement. I'm going to give you my very rough and poor uh, theological interpretation of the book of Job. I think what's going on here, because what, if you keep reading, what you're going to read is Job, that faith starts to dwindle quickly. He came out with a strong statement. It was probably what he grew up with. It was probably what he knew. It was probably what he believed at this level. But he hadn't fully absorbed this thing yet. Like, I've seen people, and I, I know this because I do a lot of funerals, and the funerals are like three days after someone dies, four days. People aren't listening when I talk at the funerals. They can't listen. Does that make sense? Like, I'm preparing, I'm doing my best, but the reality is they just stare, especially the ones, when someone's older and they've been preparing for it, it's maybe a little bit different, but especially the ones of absolute shock, like this one would be, they're just, their eyes are just glazed, and they're just surviving the event. No, this is true. They're not going, oh, that's a good point, Pastor. Make sure I write that down, and I'll say that to myself next week. There's people everywhere. They're surviving the event, and oftentimes they will say something of a Christian cliche. Well, at least they're in heaven. And all of us, we all struggle too. I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. Because what do you say to someone that's gone through this? You just do your best. You throw some stupid cliche out there and you, you feel bad for even doing that, but you don't know what else to do. As long as you know, should I even not call? Am I bugging them? Come on. Let's be honest. Like, I don't know. Is it too much? Am I on too... If I avoid, I don't say anything. Those something to say. But oftentimes the first reaction sometimes is just the, the, the thing that you were, well, I came naked, I'm leaving naked. And it's unbelievably profound. I mean, this, this these sentences have been used over and over and over again. But I think what you have to do is you have to say them, but you have to come all the way back to them. Because Job, after this, he's going to go through a mess. And he's not going to repeat that. He's going to accuse God of all kinds of things and people and this and that and everybody. It's going to get all confusing. Because the only way for your faith to get real genuine is it has to get all confusing. Because the childlike-ish, I should, there's a difference between childlike and childish faith. I should actually make that distinction for us. You know, because Jesus actually um, praises like what I will call a childlike faith. But a childish faith is different. And it's, they're very similar. That's why, but you, you have to like cycle back around to it where it's all simple again. Mm. I don't even have enough time. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Like you have to go through all this doubt and this questioning, this unbelief. And then either you go into like, nothingness of, of, of agnosticism and, 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 and narcissism, or you, you cycle back and you go, no, 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 no. God is still good. It's the full circle back. That's why I kind of settled on the title, God is still good. But that's a journey. And no one should be beat up for wherever they are on this journey. Does, does that make sense? Because you could be right there saying, oh, God is good, God is good. And the reality hasn't even set in. It's like three weeks later. Let's talk about how you really feel. If you're under no pressure, you're not in front of a pastor, you're not at a church, but how do you really feel? And that's okay.
I think it was almost muscle memory for Job. When he gets to the second test, uh, we're out of time. But his wife, his wife gets on to him. It's like, you still holding on to that Jesus stuff? I mean, paraphrase, you know. She bails shit first. Hello? You lose both your, you know, they say like one of the most trying things for a marriage is the loss of a child. I don't know the exact stats, but a lot of them don't survive it. Because the anger, the, the rage, the bitterness, it's just like it has to get pushed out on somebody. That sometimes it gets pushed out on the other person that's available. Hmm? Hey, man, if you got faith, don't be smug in it. Don't act like, oh, yeah, because has the big one happened to you? It's okay. It's okay if two months later you got all kinds of questions and all kinds of doubts and things that you want to say to God. That's okay. Because I think your faith is strong and then it gets weak and then it gets strong again. It's there and the heat gets turned up and the dross starts to bubble out and it gets scraped off. And then it's stronger at the end than it was at the beginning. So by me pushing on your faith a little bit, my goal is not to weaken it. My goal is that it comes all the way back around and it's stronger than it's ever been. That somehow you would utter this phrase when it's all over. God is still good. God is some people stop saying God is. We can just start with that, God is. You know, we get to choose uh, whether you think God is or God isn't. I, I, spent, I spent the whole morning listening to Christopher Hitchens just imploring people at Google that God isn't. Brilliant guy. Wow. Wow. Smart. Like 20 times smarter than me. And, 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 you know, there's a party that goes, man, he's making some pretty compelling arguments. But the, here's the thing. Here's the thing. It really comes down to this. Yes, we need to talk about the nature of God, which we're going to do. Because maybe that overly simplistic understanding of God is going to fall apart. Jesus weighs into this debate, too, by the way. He gets into it. We're, we're, we will. But it really comes down to this. God is or God isn't. And even if the view of God has to get rearranged in your head because maybe God doesn't have this little bubble around everybody the way that we thought. Either God is or God isn't. Either all of this. When I say this, I'm not just talking about here. I'm talking about the James Webb telescope. Huh? Do yourself a solid this afternoon and Google that. Google some of those images. And the double helix, the majesty of the whole thing, either that's random or it's not. That's what it comes back to me. Either that's just some happenstance with no purpose behind it or, ready? A simple idea. There is a God. is. Hebrews says, anyone who believes in must believe that he is. You first have to just believe that he is. But for that to hold, you have to go through some fire. And your faith will have to go through some fire.
I mean, it's, it's different. It's difficult for me today it's because, I mean, so many of you have such strong faith, and I, 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 am, I personally get inspired by it. I see what so many of you have been through, and it inspires me more. And yet there's a lot of people that are drifting from the faith. And the sad thing is they don't have to. But no one's taught them this. No one's pushed on their faith from their own religious, their, their own pastors haven't, haven't strengthened it enough to, to make it through the marketplace. It was, it was only good for the synagogue. You get what I'm saying? Like, it's, this has got to be able to survive Tuesday. You know, it's got to make it through a board meeting on Friday afternoon. Otherwise, what's it worth? All you do is just come running back to here. No, no, you stand out there boldly. If it's good, if it's good. All right, that's what we're going to try to do. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for your love for us. I pray for those that are struggling today in the room. Let them know you love them. Let them, let them know that it's because they have a good heart an open mind that they struggle, not because they're bad, but because they're human. And that human after human after human in this book, from Abraham and Sarah to Job to Jesus, question God. From Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why? Why, God? It's the common question. And so, God, guide us through our questioning. We pray and stay with us through our doubt. And bring us home. Bring us home to God is still good. That's our prayer. For those that we love that are struggling, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. See you next week. Happy Sunday, everybody.